On March 25th, 2004, I was there. When the year 2004 began, my life was wide open. I got fired from my job after Christmas in 2003. I only had one more college class to pass to graduate. I wanted to focus all my energy on biology to finish what I started. Getting a job? I'll get around to it. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a segment of my life called Sports in the Days of Unemployment. But while I was waiting for my free money from unemployment insurance, I would make some memories that stood with me. A trip to Southern California with my girlfriend at the time with her parents that included a stop in Pasadena and then to the San Diego area. Laughing with my friends and enjoying the borrowed time with my girlfriend and knowing that the spring semester in college that year would finally be the end of the road. Once I appealed my rejected claim for unemployment, I would win the hearing and I would be as smart as I could with it. Nah, just kidding. I was a little foolish with it as well. From March to August, I took in a lot of games. On a couple of occasions, it would be on back-to-back -back days. In the case of one day, I did a double header. This game would be the first of many in that five-month span. After going to a Sharks game in December, a 5-2 win over the Nashville Predators, the Sharks would take over first place in the Pacific Division from the LA Kings. From December 29th to March 23rd, the team would quietly perform well beyond my expectations. Over the next 40 games, the Sharks would miss out on points in 11 of those games, meaning the other games they would win, lose in overtime, or in some cases, when they were still a thing, the game would end in a tie. They didn't go on long winning streaks, nor did they have a losing streak longer than three games. For three months, the Sharks were simply racking up the points to stay on top of the division. They would face a team that was trying to get in the playoffs and had a couple of figures that were once part of the Sharks organization. A few weeks after the Sharks fired him in 2002, Daryl Sutter would get back on his feet as the coach of the Calgary Flames. After the team's general manager Craig Button let his contract lapse, Sutter would be the Flames' GM and coach. The Flames were a gritty team with a mixture of youngsters and veterans, led by a captain with a resume that would get him inducted in the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2020. Four-time All-Star, two-time Olympic gold medalist, in 2002, he would win the Lester B. Pearson Award, the Art Ross Trophy, and the Rocker Rashard Trophy, Jerome McGinley. In fact, in the 2003-04 season, McGinley was working on his second Richard Trophy, along with being a King Clancy winner. There was one other former Sharks player on the Flames that made an impact, but first things first. Starting goaltender for the Sharks, Evgeny Nabokov. Nabby would turn around in the 2003-04 season after having an average season the year before. His win totals improved, his save percentage went up, his goals against average went down, and he recorded triple the shutouts he had from the year before. He was playing like his Calder Trophy form that year. Between the pipes for Calgary, Mika Kippersov. In Kipper's career, the Sharks were a stepping stone. The Sharks would have Nabokov as their number one guy and would keep Bessa Toskala around. When the 2003-04 season started, Kippersov didn't play a minute for the Sharks. After the Flames' number one goalie, Roman Turek, suffered an injury, the Flames would trade a second round pick to the Sharks for Kippersov. Kipper would take his game to another level when he joined the Flames. Even after suffering an injury during the season, Kipper never missed a beat, leading the league in goals against average and save percentage. He would finish behind Martin Brodeur in voting for both the Vezina Trophy and the Hart Trophy that season. He would be the best goaltender the Flames had since Mike Vernon. In 2006, Kipper would win the Jennings Trophy and the Vezina. One more accomplishment of note, Kippersov won a bronze medal at the 2010 Olympics. He would play nine seasons with the Flames, then retired in 2013, holding the franchise record for wins, shutouts, and games played. Nothing happened in the first period, just two goalies guarding their nets with vigor. Both Nabby and Kipper were performing well. The game was so tight, not even a single penalty was called. The second period was when things started to crack. The Sharks would get the momentum late in the second period after Ekman waited at the doorstep to receive a pass to net his 20th goal of the season. Robin Regeer down in the corner battling. Here's Cole Newton, and they score! Oh. A fortunate little bounce, but this is what Corey Luke wanted to do. Watch how quick the mistake Ekman has here. Oh. This bounce is off a couple of skates. Alan McCauley would get the assist along with Alexander Corey Luke for that great pass. Roughly a minute later, Mike Ricci would add to the Sharks' lead with his seventh of the season that happened by dumb luck. Puck seems to be falling. Jonathan around. Ricci! They score! And then it's just 
just get pucks to the net, and Ricci does this maybe better than anybody. Doesn't find the back of the net, but it sure crosses the goal line. Mike Rathke and Jonathan Chichu would help out. The last 10 minutes of the third period was when it got interesting. At 13.44 in the third, Sharks forward Nils Ekman accidentally deflected the puck into his own net to put Calgary on the board. Ekman really ripped that shot. And he can't. He's got a great wrist shot. There's a goal off of the deflection. Ekman and Calgary's back in it. Ekman knocked this in. Except Ekman didn't. A play that happened so fast, even Sharks analyst Drew Remenda admitted he made a mistake. Get a load of this outstanding no-look deflection by the Flames' Martin Jelena. High pass. No. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Jelena. Martin Jelena. What a job. Outstanding. I am sorry, Marty. I should have given you props for that right off the get-go. That is an outstanding deflection. Chris Clark and Matthew Lombardi provided the assists on that sweet goal. At 15-16 of the third, Brad Stewart was called for holding. A little over 40 seconds later, Oleg Saprikin would make the Sharks pay and get the Flames level. But it comes to the other side and a shot wide. Rebound, they score. Oleg Saprikin with great hands ties the game with a power play goal. We have one more look at this as the puck bounces off the boards here. Oh, who is that? Is that McCauley? Yeah, McCauley very close. I think it's McCauley. He's coming in. He's trying to make the stop. Jordan Leopold and Jerome McGinley would get helpers on the game-tying goal. About 90 seconds later, the Flames' Craig Conroy would be called for boarding and it would put the Sharks on a crucial power play. As the penalty expired, and in the last minute of regulation, Vincent Danfus would get crafty on the game winner. Time running down. Stewart to McLaren. The one-timer wide again. Kyle McLaren can't find the target. Here's Stewart. Shot Deflected wide. Hold on, Coach Sutter says better look at that one again. Right, right, but and no one touched him. That, that's a good goal. It should be a There's good nothing goal. Wrong with from that, that goal. angle, from that angle, definitely you see that it should be a good goal. You see the time running down, and the Sharks get a fortuitous bounce off the board. Yeah, you're right, partner, off the rear end. It's good. They dropped the puck. Nope, sorry, it counts. Stewart and Chichu got the assist. Let's play on. The way this game ended, it was really intense. The Flames were not going away. Randy Hahn would say it best during this last second frenzy. And he turns it aside. Kiprilov leaves the net. Calgary with a great chance to tie there. Now they have the extra skater. Ricky with the line. Ten seconds left to go. This is like the ending to a playoff game. Here's Regeer trying to throw off the boards. Three seconds left. The puck frozen on the board. This win would be part of a five-game winning streak towards the end of the season, which pushed the Sharks past the 100-point plateau for the first time in franchise history and locked up the Pacific Division. This was the best Sharks game I've been to since 2000. The way these two teams played each other that night, imagine if these two ever met in the 2004 Stanley Cup playoffs. Little did I know that I was given a preview of a possible playoff matchup when I was there on March 25th, 2004. Ricci comes in, gets square to the shooter, and there that puck is just squeaking through. Scott Thornton coming there to make sure, but Mike Ricci gets a huge goal, seventh goal of the season. 